is 60 years old. I'm not supposed to tell you that. But she ushers every year. And she comes in at 7.30 in the morning and is here till 11.30 at night. She gets to the hotel room. I mean, I get there before she does. And I love you. Wait, get that camera back on her. I want her to see that. Wait, back to her. Her name's Diane. Now let's go, let's go a little bit to the left or right, whatever. Yeah, stand up. Then there's my, then my other son, Luke. And then Ricky, my daughter-in-law. Oh, Julianne, where'd Julianne go? There. And all my grandchildren. Anyway, I'm just having a, a, a grandpa moment. Sweetheart, thank you for doing this. You've done this for 14 years or whatever the number is. I can't believe. Don't retire, please. Okay, let's... Uh, Get this, uh, uh, vi this uh, short video of what's happening here at IHOP, and then I'm going to have Ronnie's going to come up and uh, address us and encourage us and exhort us in the Lord. Since September 1999, the International House of Prayer has held its continuous prayer watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The prayer meetings are led by full teams, mixing worship with the prayer that continually goes up. In that time, it has grown in many ways. Now with a 1,000 staff who raise their own support, a growing university and internships, a thriving conference and media ministry, and a variety of, variety of different compassion and evangelism outreaches. Mike Bickle is the director of IHOP K. After pastoring a local church for over 25 years, he felt the call of God to begin the house of prayer full time. It was over 30 years ago that I began my ministry as a young man in context to a Presbyterian church. And this Presbyterian church was deeply involved with Campus Crusade and so therefore all of us were. And we were really focused on evangelism and discipleship. And then the Lord began to challenge me to add prayer to my evangelism and my discipleship efforts. And at first, uh, it didn't feel right to me because if I spent time praying, it seemed like I was taking time away from evangelism. Then it was reading a book from my favorite Bible teacher throughout my whole life, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones from London, a book on revival. And he talked about prayer and how prayer would impact our efforts of evangelism. 30 years later now, I look back and I see that it's not a choice of prayer or evangelism, but our efforts are actually increased and multiplied and our effectiveness is better if we bathe it with prayer. We have 25 full worship teams, full-time occupation, raising their own support, inspired by YWAM and Campus Crusade, and they do 84 two-hour prayer meetings a week. And when you're in that place of prayer, it has to be enjoyable, it has to be sustainable. And Isaiah 56 said that he will give us joy in his house of prayer. And so that we've found that joy comes and the sustaining joy to keep doing it over years at a time with music. And so we take the word and pray it in an atmosphere of music, in an atmosphere of worship. And so our intercessors, they pray the biblical prayers. Then singers sing it. Our hearts are awakened in revelation in the word of God. It's enjoyable, it's sustainable. One of the unique things is that uh, we go 24-7. And, uh, and that is, that's great because that means you can just walk in at any time within a 24-hour schedule and there's prayer going on. And for instance, you can walk in at 2 o'clock in the morning and you will walk right in the middle of the night watch, which is a section that goes from midnight to 6. And it's glorious to see at 2 o'clock in the morning, young adults giving their love songs and their requests before the Lord in the night. You need to understand when you come to the House of Prayer in Kansas City, it's international. And now even more so as we've launched the All Nations Prayer Room. You won't just hear prayer and worship in English. You can hear Arabic, Chinese, Farsi, French, German, Korean, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish. We have the nations here. The prayer room is the heartbeat of all that goes on. It's from this place that missions, outreach, training, and many practical expressions of the love of God go forth. On our 10th anniversary, it was evident that there were a growing number of compassion and mercy ministries that were growing from the place of prayer on our mission base. And so at that time, we made the commitment as a spiritual family to combine 24-hour prayers with 24-hour works of justice. We commit, by the grace of God, to combine 24-hour prayers for justice with 24-hour works of justice 
until the Lord returns. Well, it's a priority to us to partner in prayer with missions organizations across the earth. In Kansas City itself, our many evangelistic outreaches have seen many brought out of darkness. And those who are coming to the Lord have found healing and deliverance and freedom through our ministry teams who pray for many tens of thousands each year. Training is also a critical component of the mission space. From our own Children's Equipping Center, raising up the next generation in a culture of prayer, to the International House of Prayer University, where we are presently training over 1,000 students and interns. At IHOPU, we have the ministry school, the music school, the media school. No matter which school you're a part of as an IHOPU student, you're going to go deep in the Word of God. You're going to form intimacy in the place of prayer, and you're going to learn how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's from that place you're going to launch into your specialized programs in practical training. We want to be a servant ministry that helps others be strengthened in prayer. And that's what we want to do with other ministries across the world. We just want to send people to them to join them, not to be a part of our ministry anymore, but to actually join them and what God's doing in that city to be a resource and encouragement and a servant ministry to other ministries. Training also happens at various conferences that are hosted throughout the year equipping believers in prayer, worship, and missions. The web stream from the prayer room reaches thousands and over 200 nations, from individuals connecting on their smartphones to houses of prayer who supplement their own prayer meetings with the prayer room in Kansas City. The faithfulness of the Lord has resulted in a vibrant community of young adults seeking the Lord on this campus, which includes the prayer room, the university, and the apartments right here that house over 700 students and staff. The Bible tells us that God's house is called a house of prayer. Now the house of prayer in any city is the entire body of Christ in that city. It's not just the ministries that are focused on prayer. And this is what God is doing today. He's causing the entire culture of the body of Christ to become a house of prayer, to have a, a prayer culture in the midst of their commitment to evangelize, build godly families, reach out to the society, and do the work of the kingdom. Well, good evening. I want to thank everyone tonight who has provided me this overwhelming responsibility to speak to you this evening. It is in deep humility tonight that I come to you, but I also come to you with a great burden for where we are in our nation. This is why I am here. You see, we're living at a time in American history where the ship feels like it might be sinking. And it's a time where prayer is needed more than ever, ever before. I'm not here tonight to highlight our theological differences, but to bend my knee next to yours and to ask God to have mercy on America. I also know that my being here is not an endorsement of your theology or you're endorsing my orthodoxy. I did not get asked to this gathering tonight because the leaders agree with all of my theological convictions. In fact, if we're totally honest with one another, we know that thousands of us who are filling this convention center and thousands more who are streaming live around the world, we're not in total agreement about a lot of the secondary matters of life, ministry, and even the Bible. Yet my being here is a clear indication that these are times when people must come together and pray. And when the ship feels like it's sinking, everyone needs to grab a bucket. You see, what I love about being a part of my family called the Southern Baptist family 
is our commitment to God's inerrant and infallible word of God and our zealous commitment to it as the final authority for all we believe and practice, period. What does that mean? That means that every other word from a politician or a preacher, an author or an educator, a king or a president is secondary to the word of God and we filter everything through the power of the word of God. I also love our commitment to Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Do you believe that tonight? I love that we call sin, sin. And as John the Baptist did, we call for repentance. Our love, our commitment to grace alone and Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins. I love that we preach salvation zealously and tell people that there is both a heaven and a hell. Sin and forgiveness. I love our commitment to making disciples of all the people groups in the world and believing with all of our heart that the job will be done one day and that we prayerfully might be able to be a part of what God is doing in the world. I love that we believe that Jesus is the hope of the world. Do you believe that tonight? And that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and that the world is waiting for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But tonight, I come to you as the pastor of a local church, not as the president of America's largest Protestant denomination, for Southern Baptists do not operate like a hierarchical denomination, which means I cannot mandate people to do something, and I sing, and I say, pray, and they pray. But just as God waken our people one at a time, it is my prayer tonight that every one of us in this room will become awakened one by one by the power of the living God. You see, tonight I have been asked to come here to proclaim a message to you about prayer, spiritual awakening, and reaching the world for Jesus Christ. For at least two decades, I have been about this as a man, and I have been about this as the pastor of my fellowship. I don't know what you believe tonight, but I believe that the greatest hope for America and the greatest hope of the world is what I'm going to talk about tonight. And what I want to speak to you this evening is on the following subject. Now is the time for the next great spiritual awakening in America. We're living in unprecedented days in human history. Think about it with me for a moment. Look at our own nation. Lawlessness abounds. Marriage has now been redefined. Racism is erupting endlessly. Mass murders are taking place continually. And there is a complete disregard for human life all the way from the womb to the tomb. And when you look at the world, global terrorism is on a rise like nothing we've seen before in our generation. The persecution of Christians around the world is zooming to its highest level in decades and beyond. Girls are being sold into sex slavery. Women are being raped. Christian men and women are being beheaded for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's hard to even keep up with all of the crises that abound in the world today. And then when you look back at the church, the family of God, the body of Christ, Many of us are lukewarm in our faith. We're distracted by the things of the world. Many of our fellowships are divided. But the great news that I'm seeing more than I have seen ever in my lifetime, desperation is on the rise among the people of God. And when we get desperate enough and we want God enough, we're right where God wants us in life. And that's why tonight I believe that now is the time for the next great spiritual awakening 
in America. If you have your Bible tonight, I want you to look with me in a passage of Scripture in the book of Joel, chapter 2, and also in the book of Romans, chapter number 13. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn the pages and fill the room with the sound of the pages. If you're scrolling it up on your iPad or your smartphone, then fill this arena with the light of all those devices. We need to look to the Word of God. Now, before I read from Joel chapter 2 in a moment, I was reminded a few days ago when I read about Martin Luther and the power of God's Word that so overcame him that it led him to discover Jesus Christ. Luther said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It lays hold of me. It is my prayer tonight that when you leave, that the Word of God, which always points us to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the written and the living God, will literally come alive before your eyes, that his Word will speak to you, that his feet will run after you, and it will lay hold on your life where you're never the same again. Look with me to Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through verse 17. The Scripture says these words, even now, the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not, or your, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in faithful love. And he relents from sending disaster. Who knows? He may know and relent and leave a blessing behind him. Turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. So you can offer grain and wine to the Lord your God. Look at verse 15. Blow the horn in Zion. Announce a sacred fast. Proclaim an assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the aged. Gather the children, even those nursing at the breast. Let the groom leave his bedroom and the bride or honeymoon chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the portico and the altar. And let them say, have pity on your people, Lord, and do not make your inheritance a disgrace, an object of scorn among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? And then over in Romans chapter 13, one verse of scripture, listen to it in verse 11. Besides this, knowing the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Now for us to understand fully what God is going to tell us in Joel, we need to understand what God is telling the people of God in Joel's day. You see, God is giving us a call to his people to return to him in complete surrender, complete humility, and with a new attitude. It was an urgent call that God offered to his people. God also told them that the external ripping of a garment when something was not good is just not good enough. God was not interested in their garments ripping, but their hearts being torn out of brokenness over their, sin, over their sin. And God was calling them to return to him. How? Through this way, praying, fasting, weeping, and mourning over their condition spiritually. I want to tell you tonight, this call in Joel's book was urgent. It was so urgent that it talked about this, that if a bride and a bridegroom are in their, their cha bridal chambers ready to consummate their marriage. Before they consummate, it's so important you return to God first. Return to God first. I don't know about you, that's pretty important. We know that when we look at the book of Joel in chapter 1 through chapter 1, verse 1 through 14, a crisis was occurring as God was judging his people for their sinfulness. 
Listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you. Because he was judging them, look and see what it says. He took away his provision of them. He took away his protection of them. And he took away their personal joy. Any of that sound familiar? Joel chapter 1, verse 15 through 21, a future crisis was predicted to which Joel called the day of the Lord. A time of, a time of judgment was occurring, would occur apocalyptically at the end of time. And it was massive judgment no one would be able to endure. Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through 17, we read a moment ago, the people of God, when they heard the message of God, they responded to God. Will you respond to God in your life this week? They responded to God with prayer and fasting and repentance. And then Joel chapter 2, verse 18 through 27, when they did that, then God answered their prayer. And he saw the change in their heart. And listen to see what he did. He provided for them again. He protected them again. And he granted, he granted them joy. And everything that he took back in judgment, he gave back to them through grace. And then in Joel 2, verse 28 through 32, he says, after this, meaning after all of that, the Lord gave them a word about the Holy Spirit coming upon all the people everywhere. And Joel prophesied that a day would come when the Holy Spirit would come upon all people and God would do mighty things in their midst. Now, the initial fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32, began on the day at Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter 2, which records the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. However, the complete fulfillment of the book will take place nearer to the return of our Lord. Many of you have read the book of Acts, and you know in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached, he gave an invitation that God gave over in Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And Peter talked about it in Acts chapter 2. Paul wrote about this, that the day was now existent in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, when he declared, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How many of you tonight believe that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved? And then listen carefully. God is sovereign over all things and he's in charge of everything. Do you believe that tonight? In various places across the globe, God is at work mightily across the world. His work at times, even though he's working powerfully in certain places, it seems that it's limited in our eyes in other places. But be assured, before the Lord comes again, I believe that there will be a mighty explosion of the gospel of Jesus Christ and an outpouring of God's power due to God's people taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. In fact, Revelation chapter 5 and chapter 7 says that it will happen because one day there will be redeemed people, listen to this now, from every tribe and language and people and nation worshiping Jesus around the throne. And ladies and gentlemen, listen to me, young adults today and any teenagers in this room tonight. This is why we need to see revival in the church and awakening in America. This is why we must understand the significance of this hour. And I declare to you tonight that now is the time for the next great awakening in America and across the world. Now is the time for the third great awakening in the United States. The Bible tells us over in the 13th chapter of the book of Romans, the verse I read a moment ago, in verse 11, it tells us that we need to know the time. Let me ask you tonight, do you know how to tell the time? Now the word time here is not the word like I have a watch on or you can look at your calendar on your smartphone or on your device tonight or when you go home. And that would be called in the language of the Greek language, chronos. That's not the word he's using here. He's using the word kairos, meaning that we need to understand this is a time, not by our watch, but it's a time of significance, a moment, a point of time, a significant moment in human history. I declare to you tonight that we are living in a significant time in the history of America and the history of the world. And we must take action because of this. So what are those actions we need to take? Let's let the Word of God tonight chase after us and let the Spirit of God speak to us. 
I suggest four of those actions for every one of us here and every one of us that are watching online or we're watching via television tonight. Action number one, we need to wake up. You believe we need to wake up? That's what Romans says. Romans says that the hour is so significant that this is no time to sleep. This is no time to be slothful in your spiritual life. You need to be better for God today than ever before in your life. I don't know why God brought you here this week. Only you can define that. But many of you, God brought you here to wake you up. He's here to shake your life up. He's here for you to understand. Get your mind off of your watch and off of your device. Get your mind on the mind of God, that God is at work, and you need to do something powerful for God in your lifetime and in your generation. You need to wake up spiritually. I mean, the bottom line is, now is the time to reset your life. You believe that? God brought you here to reset your priorities. God may have brought you here to redirect your, reset your future. But I want you to know tonight, you're not here by accident and you're not watching online by accident. God has you right where you are and I want to make sure tonight we wake up. If you got a brother snoozing next to you, yes, you can wake him up physically. But that only lasts so long. I'm not talking about physical snoozing. I'm talking about spiritual snoozing. And I go from all across this country, and I can assure you, we have church after church that's filled with many people that are snoozing in their walk with God. And there's some of us here tonight, we're doing the same. We're doing the same. Thank God you're searching, but now's the time to wake up. We also learn a second action that we need to take according to the book of Joel. And that is that we need to turn to God in total surrender. Are you ready to turn to God in total surrender? I say to you again tonight that now is the time to pray like never before. Now is the time to humble yourself before God with fasting as the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Now is the time for you to pour your heart out to God. Now is the time for you to return to Him and run to Him. This is a generation that will surrender to something. I want to challenge you tonight. Surrender your all to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Turn your life to God in total surrender. A prayer that I have been praying for several weeks is the following prayer. Lord, I give my 100% of me to 100% of you so that 100% of you will consume 100% of me and overflow through my life in every way. Hey, any of you need to pray that prayer tonight? It's time to turn to in total surrender. But these are also days that we need to take a third action, and that is sound the alarm. Sound the alarm. These are urgent days. If we believe in the gospel, we believe people have a choice between sin or forgiveness. And we believe that there is going to be a place called heaven or a place called hell. That will be the destination of every man and woman that ever walks on the face of this earth. I want to tell you tonight, we need to sound the alarm. And it's not my opinion. But the alarm is the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to change lives. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus gave us our marching orders and we must resolve to tell the world. I want to challenge you tonight that we need to rise up like never before. We need an unprecedented move of God in our generation like we have never experienced before. And we need to learn to live, to live with an urgency like we have never had before. These are urgent days in America, and they demand our best. Did you hear me? They demand best. And our best is only accomplished when we surrender to God completely and we operate in the source 
of the power of God. Let me make this real clear tonight. You only have one shot with your life. One shot. Not two, not three, not four, not five. You got one. It's brief. For some of you, it's 20 years and you're gone. For others, it's 30. For others, it might be 40 or 50. For some, it might be 80 or 90 or 100. I'm begging on 120 if Jesus doesn't come. But I want to tell you tonight, these are urgent days. This is not a time for you to play Christianity or play church. This is a time for you to wake up and sound an alarm to the world that is desperate for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's a fourth action we need to take. We need to lead with hope. We need to lead with hope. Some of you may have forgotten this and it might do you well to listen for a moment. God is in control. God is at work. Jesus is on the throne. Lead with hope. How can we be filled with gloom and doom and despair when Jesus is Lord of all and he controls everything? I'm telling you tonight, we all need to celebrate Jesus reigns. He reigns. He's not going to reign. He is reigning. He's Lord of all. He's King of Kings. I'm often asked this question almost everywhere I go. Pastor Floyd, do you have any hope for America? With all that's going on, do you have any hope for America? They're surprised at my response. Because I tell them, absolutely I have hope for America. You say, well, Ronnie, how in the world do you have hope for America when all those things you described initially? Well, I'll tell you why. And never forget these words for the rest of your life. God can do more in a moment than you can ever do in a lifetime. How can I not have hope when I believe that God can do more in a moment than I can ever do in a lifetime? How can I have hope? I'll tell you why. Because God can do anything, anytime, anywhere, with anyone. How do I not have hope when I know that? If my hope was in a system, then I'd be in trouble. If it were in politics alone, I'd be in trouble. If it be in the way the business world was doing it, I'd be in trouble. But I'm banking not on any of that ultimately. I'm banking ultimately that Jesus is going to win in the end. And I'm telling you today, Jesus wins. He always wins. Therefore, you lead with hope. I close with this tonight. In September this year, I was asked to come and speak in Boston to a group of pastors. And then that evening I was asked to go to speak to 200 Asian students of Harvard and MIT. The meeting was held in the Harvard Law School. They wanted me to talk to them about spiritual awakening in America. The next morning I got up and I drove to Vermont to speak at a small college in Vermont that is a new college there in the northeastern part of the United States, a Christian college. And as I was meeting with the board of trustees at lunch, someone said to me, while you're here before you speak tonight, have you ever been over to the place called the Haystack prayer meeting and the moment where that occurred in U.S. history? I told them I had not. They said, it's only 20 minutes from here. So the four of us that were together loaded up with one of their professors and he drove us 20 minutes away to a place called Williamstown, Massachusetts. Let me tell you the story. The year was 1806. There were five college students at Williams College. 
and they were studying together several things and they and they began to meet for prayer regularly on a particular Saturday afternoon in August they were going to get together and they were going to study for a while William Carey's inquiry into reaching the heathen of the world and then they were going to spend time in prayer like they had been praying together a major thunderstorm came upon them lightning flying all over the skies thundering, thunder clapping and, and the rain was torrential and they they noticed that way in the distance there was a haystack that had been stored that if they could just get under the haystack, haystack there they would be protected. So those five college students, they ran under the haystack. They studied Carrie's work. They were crying out to God in prayer. But on that particular August afternoon, something happened to them that had never happened before. God showed up under that haystack. Their lives were changed forever. Two years later, they formed a group called the Brethren, which concentrated on prayer and missions. And then in 1810, when they graduated, they proposed that some group would send a few of them around the world. And in June of 1810, the first mission organization in the United States began. It was called the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. They sent out not only a couple of those guys, but they sent out Adoniram and his wife, as well as Luther Rice, who were some of the first missionaries who went overseas to carry the gospel of Christ. Now it all goes back to one thing. What took place under the haystack in a prayer meeting? And by the way, in 1806, when Samuel J. Mills was ending that gathering of prayer, when God showed up, they sang a hymn together, and then he declared these words to those five. The field is the world. We can do this if we will. Those men were changed forever. Historians will tell you that most mission organizations, if not all, trace their beginning back. Beginning back to the haystack prayer meeting. These men turned the world upside down. And listen, it all started in a prayer meeting. I stood by that monument that commemorates that historic event. We prayed together and I looked at that monument. And at the top of that monument are these words, the field is the world. And then underneath it, the birthplace of American foreign missions, 1806. Why is that significant for tonight? Because it all happened in a prayer meeting. Since this was the process in the New Testament church, why do we think it'd be any different than with us? It's been a historical reality in the awakenings across America. It was true in the haystack in Massachusetts. It was true in 1857. 
when the great prayer revival happened and one million out of only 30 million Americans were saved in two years of time all because of this united effort to prayer. I believe God brought me here tonight for this reason. We need to get back under the haystack again. And we need to unite in prayer for the next great awakening in the United States and beyond. Maybe you've never thought about this, but I close with this. There is no great movement of God that ever occurs that is not first preceded by the extraordinary prayer of God's people. We're here tonight to carry on hearing the word of God and responding to God in prayer. I'm here tonight to tell you now is the time for the next great spiritual awakening in America. Now is the time for us to reach America and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why you need to lead with hope. And I say to you, as Samuel J. Mills said to those four other college students, the field is the world. And we can do this if we will. But we will not do it in our own power. We will only do it with the power of God. And the power of God comes when we pray, when we share Christ, when we preach the word. And tonight I want to call every one of us to a moment of prayer together. I'm going to ask you in a moment to join me. I'm going to ask you in a moment to do something maybe you've never done in a long time. I'm going to ask you in a moment to get out of your chair. I'm going to ask you to kneel on your knees in humility to God. And I'm going to ask you to cry out to God with me for the next great awakening in the United States. For those of you that are streaming online, I, I don't know where you are, what you're doing. Maybe you're by yourself or you're with a group, but I'm going to ask you to do the very same thing. How many of you would join me? Let's call out to God tonight. Would you join me in prayer tonight all over the arena and all across America and all across the world? Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus tonight, would you hear the prayers of your people? You have orchestrated this evening. For such a time as this, we're here. And I ask in the strong name of Jesus, as all of us pray in agreement, we're pleading with you, give this nation a mighty spiritual awakening like we've never had in our generation. We want to reach the world. We want to reach America. But God, we pray for the revival of the church. We pray that we might wake up in this room, that we might surrender to God totally, that we might sound the alarm and burst forth out of this auditorium tonight with hope. And I ask in the strong name of Jesus with God's people around the world tonight, do something fresh, do something new, do something powerful in our nation like we've never seen before. And we appeal to you in humility, in the strong name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. In his name, 